Hello friends. This is Revenger What If. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto reincarnated with the power of Hyodo Issei? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. In a vast grassland under the beautiful blue sky filled with white clouds, he saw her. A teenage girl wearing shining silver armor which had some blue decorating on it with an old styled dress made from old fashioned blue cloth, underneath. She has beautiful blonde hair tied behind her head with two neck length bangs framing her face and a fringe covering her forehead. She was looking sideways, so he couldn't see her face but he was sure that the girl in his dream must be a very pretty girl. Slowly, she turned around. Her lips moved like she was calling someone or just muttering someone's name. Due to the distance, he couldn't hear it clearly. Her face was also vague, no matter how many nights he dreamed about this girl, no matter how hard he tried just to see her face, he couldn't make it. It's like he had forgotten it. The girl called out, her mouth hanged open for a moment before closing itself. The girl looked sideways again, a saddened expression evident on her vague face, and a lone tear rolled on her cheek. R I I I N N N N N N G G G G G G woke up from his bed by the sound of his alarm bell. Hyodo Issei slammed shut the annoying thing and sat up. That dream again, and also that girl. Why is she so sad? Why does she show up in my dream? Issei pondered. Shaking his head, he decided to just get the matter slide and walked out of the room to do his morning routine before going to school. Issei lived alone. His mother had died in a car accident some years ago when he was still a second grade student, after that, his father fall into despair and got sick. He followed her months later, leaving Issei alone. Thanks to his parents saving when they were still alive, he didn't have any problem living alone, but still, ever since they passed away, he hadn't been able to enjoy life. Aside from his childish dream of getting a harem, Issei had pretty much no other goal or ambition. He lived day by day peacefully, same after another. A repeated, boring life. With a bread in his mouth, Issei locked the door and walked to school casually while hoping for something great, something new to happen. You were early as usual, Hyodo kun. Shitori Suna, president of Kuo Student Council, said with a somewhat appraising smile on her face. Morning, Kaichu. As energetic as usual, I see. Issei replied with a relaxed smile on his face. Suna smiled softly at that. Of all the compliments she had received, Issei's one was the most special and also, the most ridiculous. Honestly, who on the world would say a frail girl like her being energetic? Only Hyodo Issei would. But still, he was somewhat right. She had worked hard and was still trying her best to do everything she can for Kuo Academy, but due to her cool demeanor, no one could see that even she had her own limits and emotions. No one beside the man standing in front of her that is. Sigh only you would say someone like me energetic, Hyodo kun But isn't that right? You have to work a lot, right? And to work that much, you must have quite a lot of energy hence the reasons you were energetic. Issei said while crossing his arms, Suna let out a sigh and told Issei to prepare for his first class before it was late, a small smile never left her face even after the brown hair boy ran disappeared from the scene. While doing her work as usual, a random thought ran across Sona's head. What if I recruit Hyodo kun? But Rias also has her eyes on him, it will be tough. A glint appeared in Sona's violet eyes, and soon, her genius mind had already begun making plans to recruit her first human friend. After bidding goodbye to his, maybe, only female friend in school, Issei rushed upstairs to prepare for his first class, which was math. Turning right, Issei couldn't stop himself due to his rush and bumped into someone. Quickly getting backed up, the brown hair boy was soon aware of whom he had bumped into. Kiba Yuto otherwise known as the Prince of Kuo Academy rubbed the back of his head as the school mascot Tuju Kaniko helped him up from the ground. Good morning Hyodo san I hope you're not injured, greeted Kiba. Before Issei could reply he was immediately tackled by the horde of Kiba fangirls, Issei Hyodo how dare you hurt our prince. Seeing this Kiba just sighed before he and Kaniko turned and left trying to ignore the cries of pain coming from Issei as the fangirls continued their beating. Kiba-kun, said Kaniko, breaking the silence. What is it Kaniko-chan? asked Kiba as he turned to face her. Hyodo-senpei smelled like dragon. 
stated the girl, causing her companion to stumble. Could he have a sacred gear? He replied with a frown. Possibly, replied Kaneko. Kiba sighed before heading to the clubroom, we'd better tell Bucko about this. Issei sighed as he rubbed his recent wounds from the fangirl beating and headed home as the last bell of the day mercifully rung, Anu, are you Hyodo Issei? Asked a female voice. Spinning around he saw a female teen in a uniform he didn't recognize standing shyly in front of school gate, that depends why are you looking for him? He replied, cautiously. God knows he'd had enough with the girls here beating him up for, touching their prints, and he was in no mood for the beatings to continue. Well my name is Yuma and I was wondering if you're seeing anyone right now. She asked, hopefully. No not right now, why? Frowned Issei. I was hoping we could go on a date, she replied, cheerfully. Issei's brain literally came to a crashing halt at this, a girl who he has never met before asking him out on a date. If he were part of those, perverted duo, he would have leapt at the opportunity to go on a date with a woman like that. Don't get him wrong, he loved Opai as much as the next guy but it was tempered by common sense, something that is apparently sorely lacking in those two perverts. As it was this was definitely odd and a little suspicious but his mother did always tell him to give people a chance, besides what's the worst that could happen. Giving her a smile he nodded, sure why not, is Sunday at the shopping district any good for you? Yes I'll see you there, she shouted, happily before running off. Well maybe my abysmal luck is finally about to change, grinned Issei happily, not noticing the watchful eyes of Kaneko as the girl emerged from her hiding place with a frown. All in all the date was going rather well, it had started off a bit weird with some cosplayer giving him a flyer which he then placed in his pocket but after that, everything seemed to be going great, in fact Issei couldn't remember the last time he'd had this much fun. Hey Issei-kun, could you do me a favor? Said Yuma as the two stopped by the park water fountain. Sure Yuma-chan what is it? He asked, although an uneasy feeling began spreading throughout his body. Could you please die for me? She replied with a sickeningly sweet smile as black crow-like wings appeared on her back. Issei's eyes widened and he immediately dodged to the side as his instincts screamed at him to move, only to cry out in shock as a light spear hit the spot he had been standing previously. Issei quickly backed up and glanced at the spot had a just vacated and blanched as he saw a smoking creator remaining. Yuma what the hell are you doing? He shouted, fearfully. I'm sorry Issei but you're a threat to us and need to be eliminated. If you want something to blame then blame your own terrible luck for having being born with that sacred gear inside you, replied Yuma uncaringly as she readied another light spear. Issei once again dived to the side as the light spear was sent over his head and stripped the nearby plants of their leaves. Why, why to always get the worst luck? Damn it, damn it, damn it, he thought angrily as Yuma began laughing at his pathetic attempts to survive. Gah. Issei cried out and fall over when a light spear hit his thigh. He glanced back fearfully only to see the sadistic face of Yuma who was taking joy in his suffering. Issei tried to crawl the way making Yuma laughed further. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. The brown hair teen thought desperately as he crawled away as fast as his arms could take him. The sound of laughing and mocking could be heard behind him as Yuma made another light spear in her hand. Die and she threw it at the frozen Issei who was looking at the light spear which would no doubt take his life away fearfully. Time seemed to slow down and the world seemed to freeze before his eyes as the light spear flew closer and closer. He could see his life flashed back before his very eyes. From the moment he was born to the time when his mother and father passed away and now, when he was about to die. I'm going to, die, Issei thought sadly as he closed his eyes seemingly accepted the inescapable bad ending he had taken. Recommended Ost, Straight Bet by Myth and Royd, Re, Zero Ed 2. Master, Issei opened his eyes and looked around frantically. He was breathing hard and sweats could be seen covering his body. He was in the scenery of his dream, a vast grassland under a beautiful blue sky. Issei stood up and looked around. If his memory served him right, he was in Kuo Park, dating his new girlfriend Amano Yuma and then, the girl transformed into some sort of Tengu or angel with black wings and started attacking him with some strange weapon. If he was here, in his dream, then, did it mean that he had died? Master, do you remember me? Now that he had calmed down, 
Issei turned around and was greeted by the girl who usually appeared in his dream also in this scenery. Even if he was staring at her face, Issei still couldn't see what her face really looked like. Guess he couldn't see something he couldn't remember. Remember? Why did he think that he had forgotten her while he had never met her in all his life? Why? Why did this girl appear in his every dream lately? Why was she offering her hand to him? Why did she call him her master? Issei ignored those questions and stood up with the help of the blonde girl. The moment his hand touched her though, his head suddenly exploded in pain and unknown memories suddenly appeared in his mind, showing him images and voice that he wasn't familiar with. And then suddenly, all the pain gone away and Issei had the answer he needed for everything. Why couldn't he see her face before? Because he had forgot her when he reincarnated as Hiodo Issei. Why did she appear in her dreams? Because she yearned to meet him again, to be his servant again and to be with him again. Who was he? Hiodo Issei, savior of another world, master of six servants and also the hero of Grand Order. If you are ever in need of me, please, call my name. Even though I'm not your servant anymore, our bond still connects us together. And once we meet, I want to serve you again, master. The blonde knight said that and faded away along with the scenery, her beautiful emerald eyes met his one last time before completely disappear, returning him to the present time when he was facing his death, or so he was. The occult research club room was quiet as they all prepared for the summoning that didn't happen, as the silence continued until Kiba was the first to speak up. Bucko I don't think it's happening. Damn it. He was supposed to summon me so why didn't he? Cried a distraught Rius. Knock knock knock. Come in. Rius said out loud after taking in a deep breath to calm her nerves down. The wooden door was pushed open and the person who walked in was none other than Shidori Suna. President of the student council and also heiress to the Citri clan, Sona Citri. The girl walked straight up to the desk Rius was sitting behind, an unreadable expression on her face. This morning, I saw Hyodo Issei going with a fallen angel. What is your plan, Rius? Don't you want to recruit him? Sona asked, her eyes narrowed dangerously as she thought about the other option which Rius had likely taken to bring Issei to her side. I'm waiting for him to summon me, the crimson hair girl answered calmly without missing a beat ignoring the sound of gritting teeth coming from her best friend who was clearly irritated by her answer. Then, what if he didn't summon you? How can you be so sure that he can and will summon you? From the look of it, it didn't happen, did it? Sona asked in a low voice and Rias had no answer to that aside from giving her best friend a nod. She had been so sure that after handing out her flyer to him, he would summon her to help him survive the battle or to revive him. But now, after four hours of waiting, nothing had happened. Even if he did summon you, he would have already died by the time you arrive and then, you would resurrect him into your servant without giving him a choice. That is if his body hadn't been disposed by the fallen angels by the way. Sona said calmly as she thought up some of the most likely scenarios in this situation. While her voice was neutral and her face showed little to no emotions, she was very angry on the inside. If she had known that Rias would use this method to bring Issei to her side, she wouldn't have let it happen. While he was just a normal human with some unknown sacred gear, he was still her first ever human friend, she wouldn't just stand by and let this happen if she could help it. Facing so many bad scenarios presented to her by Sona, Rias couldn't help but be troubled by the fact that her plan had most likely failed which resulted in the dead of Hyodo Issei. Silence reigned the occult research club room for several few minutes before Sona turned around and walked away. No other members dared to stop her since they know that this wasn't a problem they could interfere. You are too naive, Rias, and also, dictatorial. I'm going to find Hyodo kun myself. And with that the young heiress activated her teleport spell, readied to go to the shopping district to find Hyodo Issei. What is he to you, Sona? I have never seen you this angry before. Rias asked in calm voice as she looked straight into the eyes of her best friend. As the young sea tree began to sink into the magic circle, her answer could be heard clearly through the club room which made everyone widen their eyes in surprise and amazement. Hyodo kun is my first ever human friend. Look like we screwed up this time, Akano. Rias said mockingly as she leaned back into her chair to relax. As much as she wanted to fix her mistake, it was already too late for her to do anything. For now, she would leave the matter regarding Hyodo Issei to Sona and concentrate on what needed to be done if the boy died. Bucko. What's done is done and we can't change that, we just need to deal with it. 
replied Akano as she refilled her and Rias's cup of tea while thinking about the boy who had managed to make his way into Sona's heart. Kuo Park. Issei vs. Amano Yuma. Accessing the situation at hand, my left thigh is pierced by a light spear and there is another one coming for my life. My opponent is a super beautiful girl with bigger than jeans and she is wearing dominatrix outfit. She would have been a sight to behold if not for that sadistic smirk on her face and that maniacal laugh. What a shame. Issei ended his long-tongued monologue and waited for the violet energy spear to come closer before kicking it away with his right leg, surprising his former girlfriend. Issei twisted his body and kicked up, ignoring the pain in his left thigh. The teen stood up straight and took a deep breath. He widened his stance and closed his eyes for a moment to dig into his returned memories to find something that would help him in this situation. While he of this life hadn't encountered such a dangerous situation before, he of his past life had lived through apocalypse. This level of danger was just child play to him. Finally snapped out of her stupor, Yuma snarled at Issei and walked up to him while conjuring another light spear in her hand, intending to finish him off a second time. Persistent aren't you, but you won't survive this time. Something that you could use to surprise your opponent, you say? I don't know if you can master it, but let's give it a try. First you need to infuse your body with magic like your hands or your legs, and then. The image of his lovely saber Arturia appeared in his mind, bringing a smile to Issei's face as he remembered her teaching. Instantly expel it. Mana burst. Issei shouted out the technique he learned from his servant and propelled himself straight at Yuma who was surprised by his action again. With an empowered punch right into her beautiful face, Issei sent the fallen angel flying away. Her body crashed into a tree and fell down to the ground, twitching. Deciding to ignore the twitching body of Yuma who looked like she just had an orgasm, Issei sat down on his butt to examine the wound on his left thigh. If left unattended, it could become a trouble which might cause him to lose one of his precious legs. Uh. I need to do something about this, Issei mumbled to himself with a frown on his face before ripping his blazer and used it as bandages to treat his injuries. Searching his memories for a technique that his beloved servant had taught him in his past life. Issei quickly remembered the confused face of a beautiful girl with pink hair and brown eyes. A technique that you can use in battle? Hmm, I don't know martial arts or any offensive technique though. I'm a queen you know. But maybe I can teach you some healing technique. The girl said with a radiant smile which could possibly kill a man if that was even possible. Okay, it's possible. She was an expert at seducing, scheming and illusion magic after all. Thank you, Medibi. Once more time, you have saved me. Golden rule, body. Issei concentrated for a moment and immediately, he could feel the pain began to go away. By spreading mana across his body, he could accelerate his regenerate speed to cure some small wound or at the least, numb the pain to continue his battle. As expected, I couldn't perform it as effective as her. Guess it's only natural. Issei stood back up and dusted himself. The pain had gone away for now so he guessed he would wait for the summoning ritual to complete before going home. Casting a glance behind at the puddle of blood he had left when he was cornered by Yuma, he could see the blood moving on its own to form some sort of magical circle. Issei allowed a relaxed smile to form on his face when he glanced at the back of his right hand. The outline of his command seals had begun forming and soon, he would be able to meet his servants again. Doing a quick check on his magical power, he frowned though. Even if his memories had returned and his soul had been reincarnated in this world, his magical power didn't return with him. He guessed that type energy was tied to the body instead and so, with his currently pathetic amount of magical power he could only maintain the existence of at most two servants. Well, he could maintain the third as well but he wouldn't be able to use magical power after that. His depressing thought was abruptly cut short however when numerous light spear were sent soaring his way from the sky above. Issei tried to dodge but his weak body couldn't catch up with his mind and he was hit by two light spear in the stomach and left shoulder which pinned him down to the ground. Gah! Issei gasped out in pain. Painfully, he lifted up his head to look at the location in which the spears came from and what greeted him was a fedora-wearing angel with four black wings behind his back. He had a light spear in each hand and his dark expression clearly said that he wasn't here to play. Shit! Curse my damn luck! Guess something would never change even if you were reincarnated in a new world. Issei thought to himself before glancing at the back of his hand. Just a little more and everything would be ready. If only there was something that he could use to occupy the man with. 
Looking at the Fedora man, Issei couldn't help but grimace when he saw what he was doing to his own teammate. He was kicking the fallen Yuma who could only whine and moan in pain since she was still unconscious and weakened. What a useless woman. She can't even kill a pitiful human. Damn it. Why must I get such pitiful companions for this mission? The Fedora bastard finished with a stomp on Yuma's stomach which caused her to bend over and spat out some saliva. The girl groggily sat up only to be kicked down again by the Fedora bastard. Watch how to kill a human, useless. That Fedora bastard said before shifting his attention towards Issei who was looking at him with disgusting eyes. The man hovered on the air and spread his arms, several light spears began appearing in the air surround him, all pointed toward a pinned down Issei. Wait a minute, at least, tell me your name so that I could curse you, bastard. Issei said out loud, trying to delay his death. The Fedora bastard, dubbed by Issei, raised an amusing eyebrow before laughing out loud. By now, the amount of light spears surrounding him had increased to twelve. Very well, I shall grant you your final wish. My name is Donaseek, a four wings fallen angel. Remember that name and go to hell, human. The now named Donaseek bastard, dubbed by Issei, raised his hand with a smirk on his face. Wait a minute. Issei shouted out again and put his right hand up in a stop signal, causing the fallen to stop his assault at the last second with a confused expression on his face. Seriously? He stopped? Issei thought with a sweat drop but decided to let it slide since it worked out for him. A victorious smirk appeared on his face which went unnoticed by Donaseek Bastard as he looked at the back of his right hand. The tattoo on his hand was shining, signaling it was nearing the end of its completion. What now, human? I'm just wondering if you could give me a second to offer my prayer to God. I'm one of his follower ya know, Issei said with a sheepish grin on his face. Actually, it's looked a bit creepy with all the blood on his face. Obviously, it's a lie, but since his opponent was some short of angel, he guessed it would work. Donaseek bastard had a confused expression on his face before he sighed sadly and lowered his hand making Issei's widen. God is dead, boy. Embrace that truth and go to hell. The fallen said that piece of information with a smirk on his face enjoying the shock expression on Issei's face. Obviously, he thought that Issei was shocked because his lord was dead but the truth was a whole lot different. Damn it. Guess I have to skip the rant. Chant. Issei thought angrily as he stared at the rain of light spear coming his way. He had thought that he would have the chance to summon Arturia at full power by adding the usual rant into the summoning ritual but it seemed that his messy luck had decided to fuck with him again. Glancing at the back of his right hand where his command seals were. Issei waited with bated breath for it to finally complete. The rain of spears was coming closer and at the moment, the distance between the brown hair boy and his death was 10 meters. Finally, the red light on his hand had dimmed down, allowed Issei to have a look at his familiar command seals. Apparently, it was the same as it was in his past life. It's a red mark consisting of three different smaller red marks. The first one being a thin diamond-shaped mark, the second one was right below the first one its upper part being wings like while its lower part resembled an arrowhead. The third one being the largest was quite simple. It just embraced the second mark with its arrowhead-like appearance. Recommended Ost. Styx Helix by Myth and Royd. Re. Zero Ed 1. Issei shot his right arm forward once more, the first part of his command seals lit up releasing a large amount of magical power, seven meters more until death. Come, Arturia. He shouted out with all his power and with that single command, the first part of his tattoo disappeared, five meters until death. The wind picked up and magical power filled the air. The summoning circle drawn by Issei's blood lit up in a distance causing Donacy to look at it curiously, three meters until death. Issei closed his eyes and gritted his teeth while hoping for the best, one meter until death. Clang 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 the sound of steel meeting steel and the familiar sound of light spears being shattered filled the air. Finally, after what felt like eternity, Issei opened his eyes and what greeted him was a pair of beautiful emerald eyes filled with kindness, admiration, respect and happiness. Unable to restrain the joy he was feeling at seeing his servant again even after they were separated by death and worlds apart, tears welled up in his eyes as he once again, took in her majestic appearance. Arturia. Issei whispered soundlessly as tears rolled down his cheek freely. Standing before him with a content smile on her face, Arturia once again, took in her master's appearance before turning around. 
Her expression hardened as she glared at the one who had dared to hurt her master to this extent. Your saber servant has come in response to your summoning, master. Your orders, Arturia said without taking her eyes off the fallen angel who was also eyeing her suspiciously after that display of power, speed and skill. Not every day you encounter a human and a girl at that who can easily shatter twelve light spears in a second after all. Taking in a deep breath to calm down, Issei decided to have his merry reunion with his servant later since he had a crow to kill. Eliminate him. The young heiress reappeared in a dark alleyway in Kuo shopping district unnoticed by the civilians outside and looked around. The information about Hyodo Issei's date wasn't only reported to Rias Gremory but also Sona herself because the territory was shared between two clans. While it was Taju Kaniko who discovered this little piece of information and naturally, she reported it to her king alone. Rias had to relay that information to Sona as well since Kuo was originally, Citri's territory. Beside a matter involving some fallen angels in a devil territory wasn't a matter that could be or should be hidden. That was how Sona known about Issei's date with a girl named Amano Yuma. While she had thought about stopping him from going on a date with a fallen angel since it could a trap for his sacred gear, she had believed in Rias and left Issei in her care, and that was her mistake. Rias would forever be her best friend, but the same could also be said for Hyodo Issei. If something bad was to happen to him then, Sona took a deep breath to calm down her nerves and began her search. It's no use continuing her negative thought further since it would only hinder her. Using her magical power, Sona heightened her sensing ability to detect if there were any barrier or irregularly high magical signature around. Some sort of barrier was erected to ward off people with no sensing ability in the north it seemed. Pushing her glasses up, the young heiress narrowed her eyes and began running while hoping for the best. She pumped magical power into her legs pushing her body to run at humanly impossible speed while ignoring the surprised and astounded human around her. Finally allowed herself to take a sigh of relief when Kuo Central Park came into view, Sona slowed down and examined the purple barrier surrounding it. As expected, it was a barrier used to ward off people with no sensing ability, making them go away without minding the park. A basic barrier which could be easily altered by someone like her. The barrier is still intact, it may not be too late, while having that merry thought in her mind, Sona didn't abandon the worst scenario which could possibly happen to Issei upon her arrival. If he had already died, then she would resurrect him herself even if it meant her relationship with Rias would worsen. Sona knew Rias needed someone strong enough to help her with her problem, but her method to bring Issei to her side honestly irritated her. Everybody has the right to choose and Rias knows that better than anyone because hers was stolen away the moment her parents agreed to marry her to Rise or Phoenix. If she knows that, if she understand that, then, why would she choose to steal away others' right to do the same? Letting out tired sigh, Sona stopped her negative thought about her friend least she turned out hating her, but still, Rias could have been a better girl if she cared about other people aside from herself and her peerage more. Finally arrived at the center of the park, what greeted the young heiress wasn't what she or anyone could ever have imagined. Instead of a one-side onslaught where Issei was cornered by the fallen angels, the scene before her was the exact opposite, not really, but still. Issei was sitting on the ground with his back against a tree, nursing his heavily injured body with some strange healing technique she had never seen before. Not far away from the brown hair boy, two peoples were battling each other. One was a fallen angel with four wings wielding two light spears and the other was a human girl with blonde hair wearing an old-style blue dress and silver armor. Somehow, the girl was having an edge and was pushing the fallen angel back with her invisible weapon. Looking at the blonde hair girl, Sona couldn't help but grimaced when she felt the absurd amount of holy power radiating from her. Shaking her head and decided to ignore the ongoing battle, Sona made her way to Issei's side and quickly casted a basic healing spell on him. Kaichu? Wh what are you doing here? This place is dangerous. Issei shouted out, surprised by her sudden arrival. The young boy tried to stand up but was stopped by Sona who had a pain expression on her face as she looked at Issei's current state. A deep wound on his left thigh, a piercing wound on his left shoulder and a small hole on his stomach. Please, calm down, Hyodo kun I'm more than capable of taking of myself. You should worry about yourself more. Your injuries are quite heavy, the young heiress said calmly and lowly as she applied more magical power into healing Issei. Normally, Devils couldn't hope to learn healing magic but since her family affinity with supportive and water magic is pretty high, casting a basic healing spell was simple enough. 
looking at the ever so stiff and serious student council president at his side, and then, to her glowing hands, Issei couldn't help but chuckled. So, I take that you aren't a human, right Kaichu? The sudden question surprised Sona causing her magic to stop but she quickly calmed herself down and recast the spell. Her face visibly fell though since her identity was no longer a secret. As a human, it would be possible that Issei would hate her, a devil and decided to never talk to her again. Not that she could blame him for that but still, the thought hurt her more than she thought. Um, I will explain everything after your injuries are healed. For now, please stay put, Sona said, getting a nod from Issei who was paying attention to the fight between his servant and the fallen angel. Kuo Central Park, Arturia vs. Donaseek Clang Clang Clang. The sound of metal meeting metal resounded throughout the green scenery of Kuo Central Park as two individuals clashed against each other with their respective weapon. On one side, it was a fedora wearing man with four black wings behind his back and wielding two light spears, one in each hand. His name is Donaseek, a fallen angel. Standing opposite to him was a human girl with extraordinary beauty wearing cloth, which was better suited in Europe feudal era. Her weapon was concealed by surrounding it with wind's magic. The two lunged at each other, the man with a fierce battle cry while the girl with nothing but her weapon. She swung her sword horizontally, causing the man to cross his weapons in order to block it. His effort proved to be futile however since the weapon was shorter than he had expected and the slash was only a feint. Arturia took a large step forward, successfully entered Donazik's guard and stabbed him with her invisible weapon, leaving a deep wound at his left chest. It seemed that his experience forged through countless battle had saved him from that attack. If he reacted a moment later, his heart would have been impaled. What a dangerous woman, Don Asik thought silently to himself, his breathing was heavy and his body was covered in sweats due to his near-death experience just then. His hands were shaking lightly because of the pressure and killing intent he was feeling. He gulped. To think that I would be afraid of a human girl, Donasik silently laughed mentally for what he deemed a pitiful thought and braved himself. It had been so long ago since the last time he thought he was afraid of someone. To think that a human girl could cause him to feel so much fear, Donasik couldn't stop himself from shaking in excitement. Woman, answer this one question, will you? Your weapon, it's a sword, isn't it? Donasik asked calmly, hoping to discover the truth behind that invisible weapon of the girl. If he didn't know at least its length and width, he would be at a huge disadvantage against her. But then again, he doubt the girl would just spill out whatever information he needed. After all, she was an experienced warrior. Donaseek could say that after clashing with her. My weapon? Arturia smiled mockingly before continuing. Why must it be a sword? It could a lance, an axe, a staff, or even a bow. Why don't you find it out yourself, fallen angel? Finished. Arturia's turn serious again and her stance widened, her invisible weapon at her side. As you wish, Donaseek smirked at the blonde hair girl and conjured numerous light spears in the air around him. Arturia narrowed her eyes and flared her magical power, she took a step forward but then, an unfamiliar magical signature appeared, causing her to stop. She looked toward the black hair girl who was approaching her master with impressive speed and narrowed her eyes. That girl surely wasn't human with her rather large amount of magical energy. Issei is heavily injured. If he was to be attacked now, then, I won't let it happen. Arturia thought before flaring her magical power again. Her action didn't go unnoticed by her master however. Concentrate on your fight, Arturia. This girl is an ally. She heard Issei said through his telepathy and mentally nodded. Swoosh the sound of air being cut caught her attention and Arturia quickly turned around to deflect more than a dozen of light spears flew her way. Not giving the fallen any chance to continue his attack, the girl stomped the ground and propelled forward with impressive speed thanks to mana burst. Arturia did a spin in midair and brought her sword down to behead Donaseek. The fallen angel quickly took a step back and conjured two light spears to block the attack. The light spears shattered upon impact though and a deep gash appeared on Donasi's chest from his right shoulder to his left hip. The fallen angel fell to his knees before the blonde servant, he knew he didn't have much time left and so, he asked the questions which had been bugging his mind ever since the blonde girl appeared. You, what the hell are you, woman? Donasi gasped out, seemingly out of breath after his intense battle. What am I? I'm Issei's servant and he is my master. Arturia replied. A content smile on her face as if she was proud of it. 
Donasik stared at her for a while before a smirk appeared on his face. I don't know what you are talking about, but I'll accept it, may I ask your name too? I'm Saber. HMPH. What a scary woman, you don't even grace a fallen like me with your name. It's like I said, my name is Saber, and also, for the enemies of my master, I'm being scary is good enough. With that said, Arturia turned around and ran towards her master, leaving Donasik alone. The man didn't have much time left anyway and his subordinate, comrade had left him behind the moment she realized he was going to lose. Master. The blonde servant called out, catching Issei's and Sona's attention. Issei smiled at her warmingly while Sona subconsciously flinched. Arturia kneeled down, worry evident on her face as she took in her master's condition. It was better than when she had just been summoned and she guessed that was thanks to the black hair girl next to him. Good fight out there, Arturia. Issei said proudly while giving the blonde servant a thump up with his still active right hand, causing a smile to appear on her face. Thanks, master. Though, may I ask who is she? I can sense that she isn't a human N. Her magical energy feels, dark. Arturia said calmly to her master while still keeping her guard up if the girl proved to be hostile now that her identity had been exposed. I know. Kaichu, now that Arturia is also here and my condition is also better, I believe it's time for you to explain what is going on. Why am I suddenly attacked by some fallen angels and who you really are? Issei asked calmly with an excited expression on his face, unlike his servant who was paying her full attention to Sona with a stoic face. Hyodo Issei had an adventurous spirit which was manifested during his adventure through time and space, Grand Order, in his past life. And now, even after merging with his other self in this world, that spirit still remained and was longing for another lifetime adventure. Who knows what kind of dangers he would put himself in in this dangerous world and what kind of people he would meet and bond with. Just the thought of venturing through this dangerous world excited him to no end. But first, he needed information. Right. Now then, allow me to explain your situation in the simplest way possible. Hyodo kun, I welcome you and your friend to the supernatural world. Sona pushed up her glasses for some more dramatic effect, causing Issei's eyes to sparkle with childish excitement while Arturia just stared at her dryly. The supernatural world is what its name suggests a world where mythical beings like devil, angel, and fallen angel exist, and also, yukai, gods, goddesses, in the supernatural world. There are three major factions devils residing in the underworld, fallen angels sharing the underworld with the devils, and finally, angels on heavens. Sona said with a three finger pointed up, each indicating one of the three major factions. By now, both Issei and Arturia were both paying her their utmost attention. As you may have already figured it out, those three factions don't get along with each other, hence the Great War, which happened since the beginning of the three factions and ended several hundred years ago. After the Great War, due to a state of extreme exhaustion after the Great War and with all three factions losing their main forces, none of the three sides wanted to continue battling. So while there was no peace between the factions, outright battles did not occur either. With that said, Sona finished her brief explanation on the supernatural world. The girl pushed up her glasses and looked at Issei and his friend to see their reaction. Issei had a hand supporting his chin, his face was stoic while his eyes were concentrating on the ground. He was thinking about something she guessed. Sitting next to him in Siza position was Arturia. The blonde knight had her eyes closed in concentration, she was also thinking about something too, maybe. Hum, Arturia, do you feel anything irregular or different? Issei asked while rubbing his chin with his hand. Yes, there are more mana in the air. I see, so it's true after all. The age of God, still exist, Issei said with an excited expression on his face. In his old world, the age of God had ended long, long ago and the nearest age to it which he had had the pleasure to travel to was the age when Gilgamesh was still alive. He had been fascinated by the old world where many, many mythical creatures roamed the earth freely and magecraft was closer to magic. And that's when the age of God had ended. To think that he would have the chance to live in a world where that age of myths and legends still remain, it was like dream come true to Issei. But still, he would never forget that one time when he and his servants fought alongside Gilgamesh and Enkidu against those demonic beasts. If more of those beasts were in this world then, he needed to be more well prepared for his adventure. With his goal now set, Issei nodded and smiled at Sona. To the final question, Kaichu. Who are you? 
Sona subconsciously stiffened at the question and that action didn't go unnoticed by the master and servant duo. The young heiress sighed and stood up. A pair of bat wing appeared on her back and a magic circle appeared on her hand, bearing the symbol of the Sea Tree Clan. Heiress to the Sea Tree Clan of the 72 Pillars of the Underworld, I'm Sona Sea Tree, a devil. Sona stared at the two, expecting some hostile reaction, but much to her surprise and embarrassment, Issei was staring at her with his eyes sparkling with childish excitement. S.S. Sugoi. Is that real? And do you have a pointed tail? Can you fly? Issei asked repeatedly, making Sona blush at his childish antics which were rather cute in her opinion. Shifting her eyes towards Arturia, the blonde girl was rubbing her temple tiredly while watching Issei carefully examine Sona's wings much to the latter's embarrassment. Master, friendly as she may be, that girl is still a devil. Arturia said with a small pout on her face as she watched her master paying more attention to Sona than her, his servant. Daijubu, no worries, Sona is our ally. She is my only female friend in Kuo and a kind heart individual. I believe her. You should too, Arturia. Issei said confidently with an relaxed expression on his face. Beside, you said the same thing about Jean and Shudan too. But in the end, they are literally harmless unless you make them angry. Jean just has a little problem with her chunibyo and her tendency to create trouble with others or chaos, as she calls. And Shudan is just a drunken little girl who spends all days sleeping and drinking. They are both kinda cute in their own way, ya yeah, know. Issei said with a knowing smirk on his face as he recalled the memories of his servants, making Arturia sigh and surrender. While Sona was tilting her head, wondering who Issei was talking about. He seemed to know and understand them very much but what were they to him and where were they? And what he said earlier to the girl called Arturia, the Age of Gods, it made Sona curious about his origin and all. But still, what surprised her and also, made her suspicious about Issei was his reaction toward the supernatural world. She suspected that considering her prowess in battle, Arturia might be a part of the supernatural world, the church more likely since she had in herself a lot of holy power hence her not so surprising reaction. But then, what about Issei? Considering his reaction, she was sure that he didn't know about the supernatural world until she told him, or at least, the part she told him. But then, another question appeared, why didn't the girl told him about the supernatural world on her own? Issei seemed to be familiar with the concept of supernatural, like he had been involved with it before but, he didn't know about the three factions, uh, all those thoughts were causing her a headache. Thanks for the treat, Sona. For now, I would like to go home and rest in tomorrow too, if I can. Issei asked while holding his still ache stomach. The wound had disappeared but there were still some after affect and also the fatigue was beginning to catch up to him. Very well, Hyodo kun Tomorrow, you can rest at home. When you come to school again, please make sure to bring your friend along too, I can enroll her into Kuo if you want. Sona said with a smile before activating her teleport circle and disappeared. We should head home too, Arturia. I will lead the way, Issei said, receiving a nod from his servant who fell in step with him a moment later. Yes, master, recommended Ost, another heaven, heavens feel opening. Kyoto residence, midnight. On the rooftop of a normal two-story building sat a young boy with brown hair and a young girl with blonde hair, both wearing casual outfit. The boy with his black pant and white t-shirt and the girl with a one-piece white dress. They are none other than Hyodo Issei and his loyal servant Arturia Pendragon. Sitting together under the clear night sky, bathing under the moonlight while enjoying the cool night breeze, the two of them were talking about the adventure they had gone through together, each with a content smile on their face. Issei was as ever but Arturia had let her hair down, revealing them to be a little past her shoulder. What are you going to do now, master? Arturia asked after sipping her cup of sake. What am I going to do now, what do you mean? About your situation, you are in a new world now, aren't you, master? Ah, that, hum. Let's just enjoy ourselves, Arturia. I want to know more about this world, I want to know more about each and every other races living in this incredible world where the age of gods still remain. I want an adventure. Issei finished with his hand held up into the sky like he was trying to reach something. Looking at his relaxed expression from the sideline was Arturia who was still thinking if this was all a dream. After completing all the orders and saved the world from destruction, Issei had fallen and left all of his servants behind. 
While eventually, they would return to the throne of heroes and their physical body would disappear, their emotions still existed. And so, after who know how many years of living in their separated dimension, Arturia hadn't expected that she would be summoned again by the one she had vowed to live and die for. Today was like a dream to her. Being summoned again by her master, fighting alongside him, talking to him and drinking with him, Arturia, for once, was truly happy that she had been summoned by him during Grand Order. Silently, she leaned on Issei's shoulder and closed her eyes. For now, she would focus on this feeling, and for now, she would relish this moment, her precious moment with her precious master. In a new world with the age of gods still remain, to survive in this dangerous place, I would need to bring all of them here and train myself to be stronger. One more hour and my magical power will reach its peak. Let us relish this moment together before welcoming our comrade, Arturia. Issei said before putting his right hand on Arturia's shoulder and pushed her closer to him. Hi, master. It had been one week ever since the enrollment of two certain heroic spirits of Hyodo Issei and it could only be described with one word. Hell. Due to some unique circumstances, he had become the jerk of Kuo Academy while his servants had become its two new celebrities. Ice Princess Arturia Saber was the title she had been given during her first day at school. Strict, lawful, beautiful and intelligence, Arturia had quickly become one of Kuo's celebrities within her first few days. Then everything only got worse when the girl became the new third seed of Kuo, standing only behind Sona Citri and Rias Grammary in study. With her reputation skyrocketed, Arturia became the center of every fanboy in Kuo Academy. Of course she refused them all which later earned her the title, Ice Princess, and, apparently, she also said that she was Issei's servant which resulted in the poor guy being called, Jerk. Joining Kuo Academy the same day as Arturia was another beautiful blonde girl with French origin named Joan Alter, the Empress. While being friend with the so-called, Ice Princess, Joan was exactly the opposite of Arturia. Bad scores, bad attitude and also bad language, overall, a punk. But even so, she was still famous for her unreal beauty and fearless attitude. How fearless? Let's just, read. On her first day, Joan refused and insulted 198 boys who were trying to appeal to her. On the same day, Joan was called into the minister office for sleeping in class, insulting teacher and fellow student. On her second day, Joan sent 255 boys to the hospital who tried to use violence to force her into a relationship with them. Thankfully, the camera recorded her situation and she had luckily escaped from being thrown out of school. On her third day, Joan injured a PE teacher who tried to teach her how to speak to her seniors. On the same day, Joan sent 328 delinquents into the hospital who was hired to capture her along with 77 others who picked a fight with her. On her fourth day, Joan broke into Issei's and Arturia's classroom and demanded the boy in question to give her the necessary money to buy ice cream. On the same day, Joan announced that Issei was her master. This was later written into a notebook of student A as the most shocking announcement in Kuo's history. Literally speaking, Joan had quite a record and that record was what earned her the title the Empress. When being called as such, the girl had quite a satisfied expression on her face. Kuo Academy Issei's classroom Hyodo Issei was currently sitting in his class, looking at a small paper on his table. He was examining the flyer he had received from some strange cosplayer the day he was first attacked by the fallen angel. At first glance, it was just a small paper with a wheeled symbol on it printed in crimson red and normally, people would just throw it away. But, for an expert in using portable magic aka craft essence like him, Issei had seen something strange in this paper and kept it for experiment's sake. His effort was paid off after he successfully decrypted the magical seal and found out that it was a fucking teleport magic. In his old world, this fact was deemed impossible because teleportation wasn't something Magecraft could come up with. It was closer to the second true magic kaleidoscope. Speaking of kaleidoscope, he could make a craft essence named kaleidoscope with the instruction he received from its current wielder Zelrech himself. But instead of dimension jumping or teleportation, it could only refill his magical power. Strange, right? Maybe the old troll had decided to mess with him by giving him the wrong recipe. Back to business, after that huge and astounding discovery that even Arturia and Jean were amazed, he had decided to ask the only person that could possibly know about magic in this world. Sona Citri. A huge smile appeared on Issei's face as he thought about the possibility of using magic he had never even thought of. 
What a great world this is, even if it's a little messed up with all the war and the factions thingy. The school bell rang and immediately, Issei dashed to Arturia's table which was next to him. The girl was studying hard, unlike a certain anti-hero spirit. Go to the council and tell Sona we are coming, Arturia. I will call Jean and catch up with you later. Issei said and ran out of the room. Jean was also a second year student like him and Arturia but she was put into a different class because his was already full. Of course the girl wasn't happy with it and neither was he and Arturia. Maybe the same couldn't be said to Arturia because the girl had some really smug look on her face whenever she said she was going to class with Issei to Jean. Just side information, that face really doesn't suit Arturia, it's creepy. Gently putting her pens and book into her bag, the blonde girl slowly stood up and went out of the room as well. She was stopped midway by a girl with brown hair done in twin braid and wore glasses however. This girl was Kiryu Aika, classmate of her and Issei, the girl with a unique ability that would rather left unsaid because of how useless it is. Arturia Chan, could you please, explain your relationship with our famous loner, Hyodo Issei? Aika asked while point her finger at the blonde servant who had a confused expression on her face. He is my master and I am his servant. That's all. I believe I have already said that, or do you not believe me? Arturia answered with a nonchalant expression on her face. With her charisma passive skill, what Arturia said suddenly turned into something a king would ask his loyal subject when they doubted him. Aika waved her hand negatively, denying the fact that she didn't believe Arturia. No, no, not like that. It's true that it's super hard to believe that you and Issei are in s and relationship with each other but what I want to know is why and what is it exactly? Aika said in a hurry but soon, her expression changed into one of concentration as she waited for Arturia to respond. The blonde girl in question tilted her head cutely to a side which made the boys in class including the perverted duo, blush at her cuteness and sigh in content. It's just a normal master and servant relationship, we look out for each other take care of each other and help each other out when they need. He giving me orders and I fulfilling his wills. Arturia said with a smile while Aika nodded to show her understanding. Why, huh? Because I want to be his servant, if there aren't anything else, then I need to go. See you later. The blonde said, full of confidence and walked out of the room to do as her master wished. Looking at her distance back, Aika sighed and returned to her table. I can't believe that someone so wonderful like you is a Maso, Arturia Chan. Meh, guess no one is perfect. Kuo Academy. Jean, classroom. The classroom was strangely quiet even after the bell rang, signaling the end of their class. No one dared to move out of their spot or even cause a single noise. Their teacher had already left the class in a hurry after the bell rang, so why were they so stiff? The reason was a beautiful girl with shoulder length light blonde hair sitting at the back of the class, gazing out the window with a faraway look in her eyes. She has intimidating yellow eyes that could cause those with weak heart to yield to her, but there are also some certain feeling in them sadness and nostalgia. Just side information, she wasn't wearing the usual uniform of Kuo Academy. After acquiring permission from the minister himself with special method, she was now wearing a modified version of Kuo uniform which was painted black. Sadness and nostalgia, some might think that the special class Avenger doesn't have any other feeling others than hatred and vengeance, but, sadly, they were all wrong. For example, the Count of Monte Cristo. Edmund Dante was an Avenger class servant but his love for his mistress Haiti hadn't changed at all. And she, Jean d'Arc Alder or Jean Alder for short is also an Avenger class servant and she also knows what love is. Flashback. Chaldea 20xx. I've already told you to ignore me. It is not advisable to be too close to a cursed witch. You will be burned along as well. She said with an irritated expression on her face as she turned around to see none other than her master Hyodo Issei. The boy was tailing her while humming a happy, unknown rhythm. But I want to be with you, Jean. I want to know you more and be closer to you, Issei said with a charming smile on his face. Jean sighed and walked away, ignoring her master again. Please don't bother me and go break the heart of some other servant if you want. Come on, Jean. Don't be so cold, we have been together for quite some times already and I really, really want to know more about you, Jean. Issei said as he ran past the Avenger servant and stood before her. Hey, You are so persistent. I'm a cursed witch you know, if you are any closer to me th. 
Jean said with a scowl on her face while summoning a pitch black flame on her left hand. Whatever she was going to say however was interrupted when an irritated Issei grabbed the hand she was holding the flame with causing her to extinguish it lest she harmed her master. What are you? I don't care if you are a cursed witch you are not, Jean. Issei shouted with all his might, silencing the Avenger servant mid-sentence. He gripped the hand he was holding tightly as if she would run away the moment he loosened his grip. I don't care if you are a cursed witch or not, Jean. I don't, really. For me, you are Jean Alter, my servant and my loved ones. I love you Jean, I want to know more about you, I want to care about you, I want to show you how awesome I am and I want you to be happy. I want you in my world, Jean and in exchange, I will become your world. Issei said passionately as he held onto Jean's shoulder tightly. His determined eyes looked straight into her surprised eyes, unwavering and passionately. A blush formed on Jean's face as she averted her eyes, her lips moved a bit and her muttered was heard, breaking the short silence. Are really? She stuttered, she really did stutter. A smile spread on Issei's face as he looked into her eyes again and nodded slowly. Really? Believe me, Jean. I won't betray you. I won't leave you alone. Slowly, Issei embraced the Avenger servant. Her shoulder stiffened at first but slowly, she also returned the gesture. I love you, Jean. You um. The Avenger servant hummed in agreement as she nodded awkwardly into the Issei's shoulder. Flashback. Chaldea 20xx golden dust radiated from Jean's body as she closed her eyes in bliss. Not that kind of bliss mind you. Her outer armor disappeared in a shower of golden dust, showing off her porcelain white skin, flat stomach, bare shoulders almost her entire back and her beautiful thighs. Her busts also got a bit bigger now that her armor were off. Another shower of golden dust appeared and this time, a pair of high heel steel boots appeared on her legs, a pair of black steel gauntlet appeared on her arms and she also got a flower-like black steel skirt. Her hair was now getting longer and longer, turning to the same length as Jean d'Arc, ruler, but her was wavier and has a lighter color. Jean opened her yellow eyes and looked into the empty space with a faraway look in her eyes. Her master's presence momentarily forgotten as Jean muttered out loud her thought after reliving her past during her final ascension. My grudge. No, there's probably nothing in this world that can compensate it, but then again, to meet you might be considered a miracle, master. Thank you. Come. What did you just call me, Jean? You just called me master, right? Right? Issei asked, bewildered because he had never thought that he would, someday, heard Jean calling him master. From the very first day, she had just kept calling him Issei, even after their relationship began, that had never changed, but just now. Ha ha. What are you saying, you as my master? Nonsense, and I didn't say anything good about you too, understand? Jean said while looking sideways to hide her blush. Really, forget it then, but I also heard something else. Eh, thank you, I guess, Issei asked mischievously as he faked a confused expression. He had already known the truth, but teasing Jean was so fun that he couldn't restrain himself. HMPH. Your ears definitely have problem, I didn't say anything. I didn't say you did though, cough no now that I have reached my final ascension, you have done with me right? Are you going to shower other servant your attention like you do with me? Jean said calmly, her face was still a bit red from the previous embarrassment. What are you talking about, Jean? There is no way I would just abandon you. We have a promise, remember? And I'm not going to break it. Issei said nonchalantly as he approached Jean and held her hand in his. I see. So you wish to be burnt? Okay, okay, I will do that someday. You will definitely regret it when that day comes. If you still have no regrets knowing this, I will accompany you even to the depths of hell. Jean said as she shook off Issei's hand and walked out of the training room a blush on her face as she was reminded of the promise. I have no regrets, Jean. Not then, not now and there won't be any either, Issei answered softly as he looked at Jean's retreating back. Present time, Kuo Academy, Jean's classroom. Wait a minute, why am I thinking about that all of a sudden? Jean thought with a blush on her face and abruptly stood up, knocking off her chair during the process. Unknown to her, her sudden action had caused quite an amount of student in class to flinch in fear, some even pissed their pants because of the scary empress. The door was slid open and walked in an excited Hyodo Issei. The boy ran straight to Jean's desk, ignoring the fearful students around and grabbed her hand. 
We are coming to the student council, Jean. Come with me. The brown haired teen said just that and dragged Jean away, who instead of resisting, allowed him to do that. The Avenger servant then looked at his hand, which was holding her tightly and securely with sad eyes. A tray thought ran across her mind. Just not a week ago, I have tried to kill you, Issei. Yet, why are you still so kind to me? Jean thought, remembering her reckless action when being summoned by Issei into this world. One week ago, Kyoto Residence 1 AM. Let silver and steel be the essence. Let stone and the Archduke of Contracts be the foundation. Let black be the color I pay tribute to. Let rise a wall against the wind that shall fall. Let the four cardinal gates close. Let the three forked road from the crown reaching unto the kingdom rotate. Kyodo Issei could be seen standing on a summoning circle in a dimly lit room with his hand outstretched and his eyes closed in concentration. 1 a.m. was the time his magical energy reached its peak and tonight, he would summon another member of his family into this world. He continued the long incantation, causing the summoning circle beneath his feet to grow brightly with each words. Let it be declared now your flesh shall serve under me, and my fate shall be with your sword. Submit to the beckoning of the Holy Grail. Answer, if you would submit to this will and this truth. Arturia was also with him in her casual outfit, she was standing outside the magical circle, patiently waiting for her comrade, friend and sister to come. She smiled when the summoning circle lit up brightly, illuminating the dark room with its red light. An oath shall be sworn here. I shall attain all virtues of all of heaven. I shall have dominion over all evils of all of hell. With that said, the incantation was finished and blue energy shot out of the summoning circle. It twirled around like a twister of pure energy for a few seconds before pitch black flame suddenly engulfed its entire form. The column of black flame and energy got smaller and smaller until it was completely dispersed with a swing from the summoned servant's weapon, a battle standard. There, standing in the middle of the summoning circle in all her glory was none other than the only special servant Issei had, Avenger. Jean d'Arc Alter. She was in her second state judging by her outfit. She wore a black from head to toe battle outfit which consisted of a black slid dress underneath and a black steel armor that hugged her body and killer curves nicely. Overall, her appearance was that of a professional warrior possessing unreal beauty. On her left hand, she held her battle standard which bare the image of a wicked dragon while she held her once sacred sword in her right hand. Her intimidating yellow eyes opened and immediately, she locked eyes with Issei. A joyful smile appeared on the latter's face while an enraged expression appeared on Jean's. She swung her dark, flaming sword at him, ignoring the usual restraint of the command seals. A surge of winds blown Issei along with some other object in the room away as Arturia summoned her invisible air to block Jean's sudden attack. Jean, what are you doing? You are attacking our master, Arturia said as she used mana burst to push Jean back. The Avenger spirit flipped in midair and landed safely on the floor, her yellow eyes burning with hatred and vengeance as she looked at Issei rather than Arturia. You. Who are you? How can you summon me and why? Why do you so much like him? Jean asked in a hurry as she pointed her flaming sword at Issei, who was looking at her in surprise. Jean. It's me, Issei. Do you not remember me? Issei asked fearfully, his voice shaking a little showing his fear of not being remembered by his beloved family. Jean gritted her teeth and sent a wave of dark flame at him which was intercepted by Arturia again. No, you aren't Issei. Hyodo Issei is, my only master is dead. You can't be him. Faker, Jean shouted and slammed her battle standard on the floor, her magical power skyrocketed and the surrounding scenery began to change. Arturia widened her eyes and released the true form of her sword, her stance widened and her magical power also increased several folds to match that of Jean. On the sideline, Issei could only watch his two servants, his family preparing to release their respective noble phantasm in fear. But he didn't fear for his well-being, he feared for his beloved servants. If this continued, the two of them would end up killing each other. Looking at the back of his right hand, Issei could see that his all three of his command seals were there. Like in his past life, Issei had infinite command seals, but he could only use three at once and every night, at zero he would regain one command seal. Back to the problem at hand, the brown hair team got up and stretched out his right hand, his command seals glowed brightly and the air got incredibly thicker now that all three of them were releasing magical energy. By the power of my command seals, 
Issei began but he was tad bit too late because Jean had already finished charging up her noble phantasm. Arturia too, it seemed as her sword was radiating a dazzlingly golden light. Le Grandemon du ha a. Jean released her noble phantasm on her own master, Hyodo Issei but it seemed that, just like Issei, she was also too late. Because of the nature of her noble phantasm which was somewhat like a reality marble, it had two states and the first part needed to be completed first before the real damage could be done. Firstly, Jean would turn the scenery around her into a living hell with dark black sky and a sea of flames, burning hungrily like it wanted to devour all living beings, and then, she would let her victim relish the feeling of being burned to death by releasing her flames of hatred on them. Frankly speaking, she killed them the way she was killed, burned alive. The first part was completed but Jean couldn't finish her noble phantasm because Arturia was already above her with a fully charged Excalibur ready to strike her down. The Avenger servant was forced to jump out of the window to avoid the deathly beam attack of her fellow servant. Arturia's attack had easily destroyed the house and ignited the night sky of Kuo with a pillar of golden light. Jean landed safely on the ground and looked at the destroyed house, seeking traces of the blonde saber and her unfortunate master. Her eyes narrowed in anger when she saw the two of them landed on the ground about ten meters away from her. Arturia was quite all right but the same couldn't be said to Issei. The brown hair teen had a lot of burnt mark on his body and he was grimacing in pain. While the most dangerous part of Jean's noble phantasm, Le Grandemont du Hain was evaded thanks to Arturia's effort, being trapped in that reality marble of Jean was quite an experience. Jean! Stop what you are doing right now! You are harming our master, Arturia said angrily as she stood in front of Issei protectively. In return to the blonde saber's words, Jean laughed mockingly with a wicked look on her face. Kukuku, our master, I can't believe you changed your heart so soon, you most despicable woman. What happened with your so-called sacred knightly oath? She argued, looking at Arturia disgustingly while unsheathing her sword. So you can't even tell that Issei has been reincarnated into this world as our master once again. And here I thought you were the one closest to him of us all. Look like I was wrong, Arturia said sadly and flared her magical power, indicating the use of mana burst. Quote dot 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 quote. Jean gritted her teeth angrily and propelled herself toward Arturia with a mighty stomp which cracked the hard ground beneath. Don't you n-d-e-r-e-s-s-t-i-m-a-t-e -E -E, my love for him. The Avenger servant shouted with all her might and attacked Arturia with a thrust from her flaming battle standard which was being used as a lance. In response, Arturia swatted her attack away with Excalibur in its released form and slashed vertically at Jean. The Avenger servant blocked the attack with her flaming sword in reverse grip and engaged in a heating deadlock with her fellow servant. A smirk appeared on her face though despite she was being overpowered by Arturia. You know, Arturia, you have never beaten me before because of a certain something, right? Jean said with a smug look on her face causing Arturia's eyes to widen in fear and realization. Kneel, Jean shouted out and immediately. The ground beneath Arturia cracked as the blonde saber struggled to stand still. Dragon Witch, an ability bestowed upon Jean as an anti-hero who was the exact opposite of all the existing hero. Heroes usually have their legend tied with one or many dragons such as rising by dragon or having a dragon pet, companion, etc., but most of all is killing dragon as a symbol of courage, power and justice. As an anti-hero spirit who opposes all heroes, Jean Alter was manifested as an Avenger who has her charisma skill from her previous class, ruler, turned into Dragon Witch which gives her the ability to communicate, understand, summon and rule over all Dragon. Because of its EX rank, even Fafnir wasn't able to escape this dangerous skill. While Arturia is a servant, the girl has in her a factor of the Red Dragon which grant her unique ability and also, the characteristic of a Dragon. Simply said, even Arturia who is only a demi-dragon and has magic resistance as her class skill couldn't resist the absolute power over all dragon of Jean. Taking advantage of a busied saber, Jean broke their deadlock, causing Arturia to lose her balance and stumbled forward. The Avenger servant reverse her grip on her sword once again and strike down, that attack never came to its intent target though. Stop! Yamera! An ear-deafening shout coming from Issei caused Jean to stop just a few centimeter from killing off Arturia. The Avenger servant scowled when she found out that she had been forced to stop with a command seal. Looking sideways, she could see her master, strangely, 
kneeling on the ground with his arm outstretched. There were only one command seal on his hand though. Recommended Ost. Krona. Guilty Crown Ost. No, seriously, play it with this scene. Stop it, you both, Issei said breathlessly as he groggily stood up and dragged his body over to Jean and Arturia. Don't you dare to order me around, you faker. Only my master can and you aren't him, Jean said with a scowl on her face as she pointed her black sword at Issei. The brown haired teen, instead of avoiding the dangerous sword, decided to grab it and pointed it straight to where his heart was. Jean, look at me, take in my form, my appearance and then look straight into my eyes, see into my very soul with your, Jean. If you don't change your mind even after that, then, kill me. Surprisingly, Arturia was silent at this and the blonde saber had decided to stay away from the two though, her sword was still ready at her side. Jean's lips parted and her eyes went a little wider at Issei's bold words and the tears that were freely flowing out of his eyes. Master, my master is already dead. Our times together, our memories together are nothing but an ephemeral dream. It was so short, yet, it was so fun, but with his death, I was woken up and realized that a dream was just a dream and all our times together was also, just a dream. Painful, sadness and loneliness was the only things that were left of me when I woke up from that dream. But even so, I still want to cherish that dream, as a dream that I wouldn't dream of ever again. The atmosphere was silence as a sad look appeared on Jean's face as she shrugged off the weight on her shoulder. But soon, she took on an enraged expression and her grip on her sword got tighter. And then, suddenly, you appeared out of nowhere again and summoned me. Why did you summon me? What are you trying to do this time? Betraying me once isn't enough for you? Is breaking me that funny to you? You are just the same as those people? You heartless, cruel, monster, I, I don't want to be your servant ever again, Jean said with tears on her enraged face but pain and sadness were also evident on it. Her grip on the black sword loosened, causing it to fall to the ground which meant the last obstacle between her and Issei had vanished. Step by step, the brown hair boy dragged himself loser to Jean and with each two steps he took, Jean retreated back one. With the last part of his energy, Issei jumped forward and hugged Jean who tried to resist. Sorry, Jean, Issei muttered into her ears and with that, the Avenger servant stopped resisting. I'm sorry, Jean. Sorry for leaving you behind, sorry for putting you through so much pain, Jean, sorry. Sorry, that, sorry, this, what are you apologizing for, Baka? I don't need your, sorry. I know. Because of that, I pledge you, Jean. Please. Give me a second chance. Give me a chance to make your dream real, please. Be my world. Why should I believe you? You have already betrayed me once. I don't want to be betrayed again. No, I'm not going to be tricked again. Because I'm your master, Jean. Issei all but shouted out as he hugged Jean tighter, afraid that she would run away if he was to loosen up. Jean's eyes widened as the words forced her to remember her happy memories with her master during his last live. Flashback. Baka. What are you doing out here? It's dangerous. I'm here to back you up, Jean. Ha? Huh? Who the hell need back up? And why should you do that? Because I'm your master. Suit yourself. Why are you in my room? Hum. To take care of you, of course. It's just a cold, I don't need your care or anything, you know. Because I'm your master, I can't leave you alone like this. HMPH. Craft Essence. Threefold Barrier. Boom. Ga. Issei. Baka. Are you nuts, taking that attack head on? But I'm your master, Jean. I need to protect you. Master this. Master that. I know that already, you Baka. Please, have more faith in me. If I can't even handle this much, then I'm not worthy of being your servant. Jean, you. I rely on you, master so please. Take care of yourself more, HMPH. It's because if you were sick then it would be bad for me. That's all. It's all for my sake, understand? No, I shouldn't think too much about the past. What happened happened and I can't change that. For Issei's sake and for my sake, I won't let him die this time around. Jean thought with resolution as she hastened her pace to walk by Issei's side instead of just following him around. Soon, the two reached the student council room where Sona and her companions were waiting for them along with Arturia. Issei pushed open the front door and what greeted him was his blonde knight clad in armor standing before Sona and her group who were sweating profusely due to the pressure. 
Apparently, the tension was quite high. Even though Arturia had said that she would remain neutral with those devils until further notice, but it seemed that she still believed that devils was evil being and was always cautious near them. Based on what Sona once said, apparently, Arturia's magical energy is potent and carry in them holy element which is their weakness. And Arturia's mana could be sensed everywhere in this room so that must be the reason they were sweating, sensing her master's presence. The blonde knight turned around and a radiant smile appeared on her face as she ran toward him. Master, I completed my task, Arturia said proudly, her ahoge swaying from left to right as she looked at Issei who had just entered the room with Jean. The brown-haired teen smiled and patted her head, telling her that she did well. The action caused those inside the student council room to open their mouth wide in disbelief as they didn't expect the ice princess to have such a cute side in her. Yo, Sona and the others too. Issei said while walking toward the desk Sona was sitting behind with his servants following him like loyal guardians. Good afternoon, Hyodo kun I guess that you aren't here for a tea, don't you? Sona said as she put her hands together and stared at the brown hair boy calculatingly. Hearing the question, Issei brought a small paper out from his pocket and showed it to the young heiress. I have examined this flyer and found out something interesting. Nay, Sona. Do you know what this is? Issei asked with a sharp look on his face which caused Sona to gulp. Ever since his incident with the fallen angel, something had changed in the brown hair boy but she couldn't say what exactly because she didn't know him that much to start with. But, the most notable change about him was that he was now more open, friendly but also more calculating, and dangerous. A person who could freely change between a friendly person to a calculating and cautious person was never a good thing because you would never know whether they were sincere to you. Another notable change was his charisma. Being around Issei in the past was like being near to any normal person, but the current Issei she was talking to was radiating a unique charisma unlike anything she had felt before. He felt experienced, determined, calm and wise. Exactly what you would expect from a veteran from a war or someone who had lived through almost everything this world had to offer. Once again, Sona had to question herself whether Issei was normal or not, and who he really is. Back to the present, Sona took off her glasses and massaged her temple when she recognized the flyer. It had the symbol of the Gremory clan on it so, obviously, it belonged to Rias. And here, she had thought that the brown hair boy had discarded the flyer after that incident. Issei had said that he had already examined the flyer so there was a possibility that Issei had already known what the flyer was for so outright lying to him would be bad. Even if she didn't know how well versed he was in magic, but it was still a possibility. With that, it only left her with two options and one of them was already out of the question. She couldn't just betray Rias after all. This flyer is used by us devil to collect human's wish. When you need us to do something, you can use it to summon the devil of the clan that flyer belonged to and we will do what you want with a cost. Sona said calmly as she put her glasses back to its original place. She wasn't lying to him, she just left what should be left in the dark in the dark and told him what he wanted to know. A perfect half lie that would work out for the three of them. Listening her explanation, Issei let out an amazed sigh. I think you look pretty good without your glasses, Sona. Of course, since he had already figured it out, the reason he was amazed was Sona when she took off her glasses. The girl in question blushed at his sudden statement and coughed into her hand a moment later to regain her composure. Please don't mind me and just continue what you want to do, Hyodo kun. The brown hair boy nodded and stood up from his chair. He took a few steps back and nodded at Arturia and Jean like he was signaling them to do something. The blonde knight returned the gesture and summoned invisible air. The sudden appearance of the hidden holy sword caused all the devils inside the room to feel extremely threatened. Sona looked at Issei questioningly but restrained herself when she saw the apologetic look on his face. Just like Arturia, Jean also changed into her battle outfit in a shower of golden dust. Black steel armor appeared on her form and her hair also got longer and wavier. In her left hand, she held a battle standard bearing the image of a dragon while her right hand had free access to the sword on her waist. Looked like the two of them were ready for a battle and Sona could only hope that their target wasn't her, Arias. Let's summon a devil then, Issei said seriously when the preparation was completed and in an instant, his mana exploded, indicating the use of mana burst. When he was decrypting the flyer, an interesting system had caught his eyes which was if the more mana was used to summon the devil, the devil summoned would also be more powerful. Normally, it would only take the default lowest amount of mana required to summon that specific devil. 
but with Issei using mana burst all of a sudden the amount of energy going into the flyer had increased several folds, which also meant he wouldn't summon that specific devil anymore. The wind picked up even in a tightly shut room like the student council room as Issei took in a deep breath and began the incantation he had prepared before. By altering the normal incantation used to summon a servant, the brown hair boy had created a specific chant to summon a devil. It wouldn't force the two of them into the relationship of a master and a servant but it would help him increase the effectiveness of the summoning ritual. Phil. 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 Let each be turned over five times, simply breaking asunder the fulfilled time. Let silver and steel be the essence. Let stone and the archduke of contracts be the foundation. Raise a wall, against the wind that shall fall. Close the four cardinal gates. Come out from the crown. Rotate the three branched road reaching the kingdom. As the brown hair boy continued on, Sona and her group could only stood there, dumbfounded and amazed. Both by his astounding talent and knowledge in magic and also how genius he is. He used an incantation to summon a devil. I have never heard of this sort of thing before, let's just hope nothing will happen. Sona thought to herself and silently reread the incantation the boy used for further research. The wind suddenly picked up even in a tightly shut room like the student council room causing Sona to switch her attention back to Hyodo Issei. It seemed that the boy had finished his incantation. Still, it was amazing how a normal human can possess such a large amount of mana and was able to control it to such extent. Appear before me now, devil, for I'm the all who shall attain all virtue of all heaven and have dominion over all hell. Finally, Issei finished and a dark, ominous aura engulfed the room causing Sona's group to have difficulty breathing while Arturia and Jean stepped up to stand side by side with their master. The two narrowed their eyes and prepared their weapon for a fight if that was to happen. The flyer in Issei's hand lit up, illuminating the room with its crimson light causing everybody to shield their eyes. Ho! Oh, to think that I would be summoned to the human world again after becoming a Satan, interesting, and it seemed that the one summoning me wasn't a normal human either, an unfamiliar male voice said as the light died down, showing the large figure of the newcomer. With a step, the man emerged, showing himself to all the occupants in the room causing some to open their mouth wide in awe and fear. The man had long crimson hair and green eyes, wearing a pretty intimidating cape. Based on his experience acquired throughout his past life, Issei could tell that the man standing in front of him was some sort of leader. He had met his fair share of kings and queens during Grand Order after all. They could live in different eras, having a different lifestyle and ruling different kind of country, but all of them have one thing in common. They all exude an aura that befit their title and position as a king. A king always give off some sort of air around them that is superior to others. Being around Arturia, Medibi and Shudan Doji for so long had made Issei able to see that air around the devil standing before him. A smirk formed on the brown hair boy as he stepped up to confront the red head. So you are the devil I summoned? Issei asked calmly, not even an ounce of fear or nervousness in him even when he was standing before an almighty devil. You bet. Introduction first. My name is Sears X Lucifer the current leader of the underworld along with three others. Nice to meet you, a not-so-human who has summoned me. Ha ha ha. Sirzex said with his arms crossed together, causing others devil in the room to gasp. Sona quickly stood up and kneeled before the redhead devil, an action followed by her peerage a moment later. Welcome you to Kuo, Lucifer-sama, Sona said in a hurry, though she quickly regained her demeanor and stood up when Sirzex ordered her to. No need to be so formal, Sona, I'm here for the unexpected summon, not for you. Sona nodded and decided to stand at the sidelines quietly to analyze the situation. It's true that the flyer Hyodo Kun used is that of the Gremory clan and Lucifer Sama hails from that very clan, so logically, summoning him is possible. But most Satan doesn't do contract with human anymore since they don't have the time to and it's very hard to summon them without their signature flyer. To summon a devil of their caliber would require a lot of determination, mana and most importantly, a strong will. The young heiress calmly analyzed the situation while observing from the sideline the conversation between Sears X and Issei. While on the outside, the girl appeared to be calm and quiet, her mind was racing to figure out the situation to the tiniest details. It's my turn then. I'm Hyodo Issei. Just like you said, I'm exactly normal, but I'm still a human. Here is my friend. Arturia and Jean. 
The brown hair boy casually introduced his little group to Sears X. Be mindful to avoid mentioning their true name as he did so. He knew this wasn't a holy grail war, but their legend still existed in this world, and who knew what would happen if suddenly, someone with a Pendragon name appeared. Now that the introduction is done, let us jump straight to business then, as if on cue, Sears X's face turned serious and the atmosphere suddenly turned cold. Quickly caught on with the situation, Issei also adopted a serious look along with his servants. How can you summon me, human? Sears X asked, wanting to know the method the boy had used to summon him. It might be irrelevant to others but if there was a way to summon him and that method was known by the opposing faction, it would be very bad. I thought you would ask about my wish first since I summoned you. Issei said calmly causing the red-head devil to raise an eyebrow in confusion. As if just remembered something. Sears X hit the palm of his hand with his fist and let out an amazed, oh. Now that you mentioned it, look like several hundred years of doing paperwork had made me forget it. Ha ha ha. The supposedly leader of the underworld laughed, breaking the serious atmosphere in the room while making Sona and her peerage sweat drop. I feel you, bro. Paperwork is, truly, the worst thing, ever. Issei said, seemingly, sympathy with the redhead devil and laughed along with him. The reaction from his servants were kinda different though. Did he ever do his work properly again? Jean asked with a tired sigh. No, Medibi and I do all his work in Chaldea. Arturia answered, remembering the amount of work she had to do in place of her master. The two servants sighed tiredly again. Now then, what does you wish, Issei Kung? Sears X asked with a relaxed smile on his face. The boy in question seemed to think deeply over something with his hand supporting his chin. Hum, I don't have any wish at the moment and even if I had, I would like to do it myself instead. How about I ask you a few questions then? The brown hair boy answered casually. Hearing the answer, Sears X nodded and smiled. The boy seemed to be independent and possessed a good nature. All right. You can ask me what you want to know, and I will answer as best as I can. In exchange. I would also like to ask you a few questions of my own. How does that sound to you? The redhead devil proposed, receiving a nod of agreement from Issei. Then, first question. Is there a way for a normal human to travel between the territory of devils, fallen angels and angels? Issei casually dropped a bomb as his first question causing the devils in the room to be cautious. Issei-kun, I don't know why you want no but I suggest that you shouldn't travel to any other realms. In this world exists many races and human is put at the lowest in its system. Most of other races doesn't care much about human but if you human are found in others territory, you will be killed on sight. But if you really want to know, then, I will answer. Literally speaking, all realms are connected to another by the dimensional gap. If you enter the dimensional gap, then you are free to enter other realms. But even for others beings, entering the dimensional gap is impossible without a specific item or method. Then how can you travel between two worlds? Issei asked while taking note of what the red-head devil said in hope of finding out something useful. We use magic or more specifically, teleportation to do so. Forget it then. Next question, is this world, fun? Issei asked after pocketing the paper he used to write what Sears X said for a later use. When he said, forget it, it didn't mean he gave up, but he would dig into it later. By no way he would just abandon his dream and live an easy life in this interesting world. A smirk appeared on Sears X's face as he looked straight into the eyes of the brown hair boy. Truly, an interesting boy he had met. He summoned a devil without any specific quest and then, asked a question that had managed to shock even him. Having deep knowledge in magic and also the talent to use them fluently, the boy would be dangerous if left alone, but if Sears X could manage to get the boy on his side, then it would help him and the devil's faction a lot. His power aside, his attitude and personality were another thing that Sears X liked. The boy was independent, he did things with his own power and stayed true to himself. He walked his own pace and just did whatever he wanted, no matter how crazy it sounded to other. He also didn't care much about social standing based on his casual behavior when talking to him. It might be that indifferent attitude which had helped him stay true to himself even in a world filled with angel, devils and fallen angels. It might also that indifferent attitude which had gotten him those two loyal followers beside him. And it might be that indifferent attitude which Sears X found himself like the most about Hyodo Issei. You bet. Sears X said with a smirk on his face which was mimicked by the brown hair boy who just couldn't resist the urge to do so anymore. 
it seemed that his adventurous spirit had been ignited again by the red-head devil. If this world wasn't fun, then the two of them wouldn't meet each other. If this world wasn't fun yet, then surely, it would be so after this fateful meeting between the Crimson Satan and the reincarnated master. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.